So I'm going to present today uh, regarding how we managed this uh, outbreak in Lebanon and uh, how we were able to procure access to all the population. So uh, to just localize wh where do we stand in Lebanon, uh, the, the cholera outbreak uh, started in Syria uh, many months before reaching Lebanon. And uh, in Syria, it, in September 10, 2022, they declared the outbreak, even though they had the cases of cholera many, many months before. We heard about the cases. We knew that uh, close by there are uh, cases of cholera, and we were already anxious that this will reach Lebanon. And the first case... Um, that reached Lebanon was declared on October 6. And um, this was a, a patient who came from Syria, who crossed the border, and he was admitted to a hospital in the north of uh, Lebanon. And um, there were a contamination of one person in Lebanon, so the second case. That's why we declared an outbreak. So any case with uh, local transmission, it is considered as an outbreak. And um, the person who was contaminated, it was a nurse. It was the nurse who took care of this patient. And also this highlighted the problem of infection and prevention control in the hospital. So we were really anxious. So we knew that uh, also they need, the need of uh, highlighting infection control in cholera is very important. So uh, on that day, the, ministry, uh, the Minister of Health called and uh, organized a national cholera task force. It was really very, very fast. And uh, the, he called uh, all the members that he designated to meet at the same night. So the national cholera task force included all the persons, individuals who uh, we were uh, were supposed to help us in the solutions. So, I mean, it was different ministries. The Ministry of Health definitely was the epidemiologist with all the persons in charge. The Ministry of Environment, Agriculture, um, even uh, uh, the sector of the army that would help in uh, with the refugee on the borders. And uh, I was member of this also committee because I'm the president of the Lebanese Society of Infectious Disease. And I will be able to communicate all the information to the infectious disease managing uh, in the, in across all hospitals in Lebanon. And um, I wanted to mention that in Lebanon, uh, we have uh, lots of infectious diseases in the opposite to the countries, this few countries uh, that uh, neighboring countries, like Lebanon is really a small country and we have, let's say, around 100 infectious disease in Lebanon. So in each hospital, we will find one at least infectious disease working in a hospital. So uh, as physicians, this was uh, the link to spread all the information for all the hospital in Lebanon. And... Um, you know, at, in Lebanon, the rivers uh, are a main source of water supply to all the regions. As you, as you see on this map, uh, we have lots of rivers and it irrigates all the regions. And uh, back in October, we had, you know that in Lebanon, we had an economical collapse. And uh, this played also a role because we had many uh, problems such as the power shortage, like in these areas, they would not have any electricity, 24 hours, no electricity, or at least a, a maximum one hour of electricity a day. Some would not have even a generator to, for the electricity because the fuel cost was very, very high and they would not afford it. Because there were no electricity, all the pumps, the water pumps stopped functioning. So, and we have a problem with uh, infrastructure. So. Um, as waste management, this was the main problem. Uh, no pumping of the water, waste management, no infrastructures. So we were really anxious that this will spread fast across Lebanon. And um, in this area where it started, 
more than 80% of the population were living in poverty. So we had to act very fast. Also, um, I wanted to note that in these areas, in these villages, because they lack of water, because, because, and also they believe that uh, all the waste is good for plants, so they were irrigating um, uh, all the vegetable with uh, contaminated water or simply the wastewater were uh, driven into all these uh, plants. So also this was a concern because we know that cholera can also be transmitted by food, not only water. So uh, what was the main function of this national action plan? Uh, uh, in this national task force, we had all the organizations, the NGOs that were able to help. So these are, I'm not going to uh, name them all, but these are the main ones that worked with us on cholera. And uh, the WHO helped a lot in the wash. Uh, you know, we, we all know about the safe drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene. We knew from the start that this, this was a main issue to, to work on. Uh, they provided all the chlorination to, for drinking water, and uh, they formed all different teams. They went to all the villages and, um, and explained about all these issues. And then uh, also they had funds to make the pumps functioning again, so they got fuel for the water pumps of these villages to make them uh, again wor be working all the time, 24 hours. Also they, they have to deal with each village because in these villages, each village have, have like uh, a mayor of the village or uh, like a small uh, villages that we have to, to ask to take permission to, we cannot enforce things, but we manage by uh, explaining everything and by uh, communication and uh, uh, also, uh, the surveillance and the routine tested, we didn't have any cholera test back then when we knew about uh, this problem, but also the WHO and the other organizations provided us very fast with rapid test, and we were be able to uh, surveil all the areas and test any case of diarrhea. We also worked a lot on education, and uh, I think this is very good uh, for uh, community engagement. We um, we had many small videos to explain for the public all the details and how they should manage. And even in each village, they did like conferences, a small conference to explain in their language, because maybe they did not have access to television. Or so different teams went to all these villages and uh, did like small meetings and explained to everybody what's going on and how they can prevent uh, getting this disease. And if they have diarrhea, what should they do? Where should they go? And um, so early diagnosis is very, very important. So we have to explain for the population or the communities that if they ever have any signs of diarrhea, they have to uh, directly flag. This should flag and we should we need to watch and to to go early to the hospital because uh, also initially um, we were anxious because the initial cases, we had a lot of deaths the first week and uh, we were analyzing every case. So I was calling every physician who was treating these cases that uh, died and we were investigating what they give them as treatment, how they presented, uh, what they think the reason of death was. And we took note of all these details over the phone, because, but we, we talked directly to the physician in charge. And they sent us also copies of the lab test. We were trying to understand why these patients are dying, because all the deaths happened the first 10 days. And at the end, we concluded that all was about uh, delay in diagnosis. The patients came to the ER very late. Already, they started complications when they reached the ER and uh, many had some comorbidities. And also, uh, they were not adequately treated as soon as they, they came, because they didn't know what was going on. We didn't know these were cholera cases, because they didn't have the test. But so it took a few days or one week to, to uh, be able to 
adjust our uh, behavior, the physician's behavior in the hospital. So, um, and later on, uh, the, the WHO, so within one week, they set the case management you, uh, you also read, uh, I'm going to show it to you. And we tried also, uh, different teams took the case management and went to these hospitals to uh, explain to them how to manage these cases. So it was like coaching. And uh, I diffused those case management to all the group on, on, uh, by email and by WhatsApp to all infectious disease groups who were, each of them, work in different regions, in different hospitals. And also these physicians uh, were given conferences in their hospital to all the, um, the physicians there so to clarify what's going on. And... Um, also, by, with the support of the WHO, they formed like an uh, IPC uh, team who went, they did like two or three, or three days of courses in these places. They, first, they went and observed what they are doing. Then they explained to them what are the measures to be taken as infection control to avoid cross-contamination in the hospital. Uh, in the ER and on the floors and uh, how to manage with the waste and etc. So this was very helpful because uh, also they, these places lack PPEs, all, all these uh, things we need in infection control. Also the NGOs and WHO and the other ones provided PPEs for, uh, for these play, uh, hospitals. They also provided the diagnostic test, so he, here we were able to diagnose very fast. We worked a lot on risk communication and the community, and uh, you know we did like um, uh, many s a brief video of one minute to explain to the population lots of details, like how if they cannot have access to closed bottled water, how they how they can chlorinate the water they drink, how um, if they are sick. Where, what to go, where, where to go first, who to contact. They have many uh, phone numbers to contact. And um, so uh, also on the vaccine later on, we did, we did lots of video and uh, the minister contacted all the TV stations in Lebanon. And uh, those TV uh, stations were uh, playing these movies like every hour at least twice or three times. So this was very, very helpful because all the TV stations, they were passing on even during the news. The majority of people watch during the news, which is in the evening, the main news at 8 p.m. So all these videos were passing by uh, all the time on the TV, from the morning to the evening. The same, uh, not the same, so we have like 15 videos. So every day, at least each video will pass three, four times across the, the day. And I think this was very helpful. And um, this was a, a good thing because, you know, all these videos cost a lot to to any advertisement on TV. So they did this for us without paying. So also this was helpful. And um, then uh, the, uh, two, two weeks later, from the beginning of, uh, we start initiating what we call the primary health care centers for cholera in all these villages. And uh, we, uh, by then we had, we had also donations of ORS and uh, from all the parties. The Red Cross also helped a lot because uh, they were calling, they had like stations in each of these places and they were in charge of transporting patients from home to hospitals. They only need a call and they come and transport the patient to the hospital. And, uh, or to these primary care center if it's not severe cases. So they have like uh, uh, primary care centers, like clinics, in these hospitals that were established on the spot. And they were being treated over one day and then they go home. And if they need hospitalization, they were transferred to the hospital. And because all these areas, they, there's a lot of poverty, um, the ministry designated like five governmental hospitals, two private hospitals and two field hospitals to admit these patients. 
And they had external funding to cover all the expenses for these patients. So the patients will not, because at the beginning, patients were delaying going to the hospital because they cannot pay the hospital. Because of the economical collapse, there's no insurance anymore. So nobody, everybody goes to the hospital has to pay from his, his own pocket. So also this helped to mobilize the patients to go, to um, let them go to hospital when they have severe diarrhea and don't think about cost and money. And um, this is uh, the initial cholera case management that you all know. So we, it was presented already over these three days. So they were divided into three categories. And uh, in each category, there are different treatment. And we, we also, uh, all these were communicated in detail. And we did like uh, pamphlets to to stick on ER uh, walls so uh, we don't lose time in looking how to, to treat these patients because sometimes you can get a pediatric patient in a hospital and uh, pediatric were not dealing with cholera so the ER doctor physician was in charge to see all these patients so we, we tried to be as much as helpful as we can and um, so the treatment beside ORS, uh, we had also the IV treatment, and for severe cases, also antibiotic was provided. Finally, uh, we started the vaccination campaign few few weeks after because we requested the we requested the, the vaccine, but we had to wait a few weeks in order to get uh, the vac the quantity of vaccine we needed. And initially, we thought, uh, who should we vaccinate it first? We chose to vaccinate the high-risk communities, such as the healthcare worker, the one who are taking care, at least the hospital, who were admitting the patients and who were in direct charge. So the healthcare workers there, the refugee camps, because all started in the refugee camps, and the majority of cases initially were in the refugee camps, then it spread across all the areas and the villages surrounding these camps. The high-risk areas, we considered them as high-risk areas in the regions, and the prisoners, because also you know that we have uh, three prisons in Lebanon. They are not in these areas, but many of uh, their parents get them food, get them, uh, so they, we cannot control. It's impossible to control uh, these things. So we thought we should, because if, if one prisoner gets cholera, it, we, it can spread very, very fast. And the prisons are not in a, such a good conditions as well. It's, it reflects also the problems in the country. So the batches of uh, vaccines we received are uh, initially 600,000 plus 600,000 that came later on and uh, other donations from Sanofi, Sanofi France. And we decided to follow uh, the WHO recommendation that one dose, one dose of vaccination should be given instead of two. Uh, also, the different teams helped a lot in uh, promoting the vaccine, encouraging people to get the vaccine. Initially, the, we started with like vaccinating centers in this region, and then the Red Cross were going door to door. They, they knocked every door and they gave the vaccine in all the villages. And uh, when we finished uh, high-risk area villages, that, so we were um, increasing the diameter of the zone according to the cases. And uh, so it was at the end door-to-door -to, -door to encourage vaccination. And also uh, to be um, transparent, the, the Ministry of Health was reporting every day all the cases of cholera on the website. They had like a platform. And uh, also in detail, this is a map, and you can uh, click on one area and see all the, the details, how many cases in each region, uh, the new cases, the cumulative cases, uh, the, the number of uh, patients in hospitals, the, the number of death cases as well, and they were uh, divided by sex, by hospital, and by outcome as well. So we had all the details. Everybody were able to access these details on the Ministry of Health website. 
So this is a resume uh, of uh, all the cases we had from October 2022 until June 2023. Uh, in fact, the last cases uh, were uh, confirmed cases were in February. So, uh, and the total cumulative death rate was like 23 cases of death. You can see that it was really 20 cases. October 17 and three more in November. So it was in the initial cases because of uh, unknowledge and uh, lack of diagnosis. So as a total cumulative cases, we had 8,000 cases and confirmed were 671 with cumulative deaths of 23. On June uh, 5, uh, 2023, uh, the Ministry of Health declared the end of the cholera outbreak in Lebanon, even though the last confirmed case was in February, but we waited like more, three months more. And um, uh, this was uh, due to all the things we discussed, the wars, the monitoring, the surveillance, pro providing the, the diagnostic test, the cholera case management uh, that was uh, taught to all these uh, centers. So uh, also we increased the capacity building of the public hospitals because they were the main uh, hospitals that admitting these cases. And uh, the oral cholera vaccine helped as well. And especially it was the collaborative work and the teamwork because really everybody was concerned and all, ev all the ministries, all the people, all, everybody helped. And the awareness and education of the community was really very, very strong. So a rapid response is a key. Empowerment of healthcare facilities, the wars, the vaccination, and the education and community engagement. This is a resume of what should be really done to manage uh, very fast. And since the ministry until today, they are uh, we have continuous surveillance for acute watery diarrhea. And every single case of severe diarrhea, all the hospitals know that they have to call the ministry and they come and they take testing to make sure we don't, because we are concerned that any minute we can get, get back the, these cases because we know, also know that more refugees are, are crossing the border nowadays and entering Lebanon again. And in Syria, there is a new wave of cholera uh, at this moment. So we are really, really anxious. So this is my last slide. You know, I, I added a painting. This is a website of my father, who's a Lebanese artist painter. And whatever happened to Lebanon, I always see the, the beautiful villages of Lebanon flower, flower it, despite all the problems. And I hope one day we will be back to, to live again the beautiful uh, moment in Lebanon. And we invite you all to enjoy Lebanon. Thank you.